clock. So here we are for another episode, which we're excited about. Our guest is someone we met through Twitter and things were really blowing up on Adoptee Twitter. Uh, he and Sarah actually had a little bit of a connection and we said, hey, wanna come on the podcast? So here we are from California. This is Bob Geyer. Hi, Bob. Hey, Bob. Hey, how hey. are you both doing? <laughs> Yeah, and um, I guess by way of introducing me and uh, being an adopted guy, um, you know, I'm 69 years old. Um, I have been actively working um, on the issue of uh, separation from my biological mother um, for maybe 18 years. Um, and that wasn't the first time I became aware of that being a need. Um, so I kind of like to go back to the early days because obviously all of us adopted people. It's the early days that matter, whether you got one day or three days or zero days or a week with your biological mother. You know, for me, um, it's really that separation wound. I know people talk about a lot of the other difficulties and wounds, and those are all true. Um, but for me, um, where I found my healing really was in the sort of deep inner exploration of that experience that lives in me, um, lived in me and lives in me all the time. Um, so uh, I like that. I like that you're, um, that you've been doing this for so long and really because we know you a little bit, really digging into this. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I, I remember your first season when, you know, Nancy Verrier's book was, uh, you know, was kind of the the guide through, right, yeah. you know, the through the chapters. And um, I lucked out and ended up doing some therapy with Nancy. Um, and I'll get to that part of the story in a, just a few minutes. Um, but, yeah, so when I was a kid, I was adopted, and my parents. Uh, obviously, I'm a, a white guy, so I've got that kind of privilege going for me. And, uh, you know, I'm not a, a you know, interracial adoption back in the 50s. Um, I didn't know it, but, you know, uh, being a white guy was supposed it was an advantage. I don't know. Um, <laughs> and uh, so uh, my adoptive parents told me that I was adopted when I was probably six or seven. I remember the conversation with my mom. She was kind of shaky. She was always very nervous. Um, and she she said, you know, you're adopted. Uh, your parents were well educated. And um, we love you very much. We love you so, so much. And I, and I said, well, mom, I just love you too. Right. You know, and that's, you know, at six or seven. And as we go back into the uh, experience of my little one inside me, um, he was hidden at that point uh, yeah. from me and from everyone else. And, you know, later, of course, I unearthed him. And uh, that's where most of my healing begins. Um, was there I, was there any more conversation? It was just that, right? Like just the. Like, just okay. that. Wait, yeah, so just she that really... did tell you or didn't tell yeah. you? She did, did. tell me. Okay. I couldn't, yeah, yeah, I, couldn't, yeah. I couldn't decide. I didn't decide for that. Okay. Yeah, she was. She was cool. I mean, you know, she, uh, my dad was a college professor, my adoptive dad. And. You know, I'll call those folks my my parents, my my mom and my dad, because yeah. that's who parented me, right? Um, my father and mother are my biological father and mother. They are the person you see in front of you. Um, you know, that's uh, I got all of this hair, the weird teeth, the uh, <laughs> you know, the, you know, all the all the us that we got, right? right. Um, but so, you know, they were, we lived in a nice neighborhood. Uh, I didn't know it was a nice neighborhood, but I do now. Um, and, you know, dad was a English, the chair of the Department of English, Cal State Los Angeles. Uh, so he was a well-educated guy. And, um, you know, that was kind of it. I would, I noticed a lot that other families weren't quite like us when I would go over to the Bell's house or the Carr's house or, you know, uh, they all kind of seemed the same and looked the same. Um, and, you know, at our house with me and my adoptive sister, yeah, we, we were a white boy and a girl, you know, and, but, you know, the vibe wasn't like going to the yeah. car bells or the Spencers, right? Where, you know, you could see they all came out of the same mold. Didn't bother me much. Um, 
you know, because I just kept on going, uh, living my life. And then I think the first time um, that I had a, a, a big awakening to the effect of uh, being an adopted kid was after I went to junior college and I fell in love and um, wonderful lady. And she got me into nursing school because she said, Bob, you're living with me. You, you got to get a job, you know, uh, you know, got to go to school. So I did. And um, she went away to school. I stayed there. Our timing went quite right. And it was the classic long distance romance that eventually broke up. And uh, we were very close. We really loved each other and still good friends. But um, right as we were, we spent a day together saying goodbye. And I hugged her and closed my eyes. And I said, don't leave till the time's right. And I completely had the experience of being taken from my mom. I saw her there. I was crying my heart out. Um, I was reaching out with my right hand. Um, someone pulled it down and wrapped it in a blanket. And I reached out and I said, don't leave me. And just emotionally and psychically, she said, I will never leave you. And boom, I came out of, out of the experience back into the room with my you know, ex-girlfriend. And I could see that that whole pattern characterized every relationship I had with every girlfriend. Okay, Bob, that's pretty amazing. Really? Yeah. I mean, yeah. really. Well, thanks. I mean, <laughs> I didn't try to do it. No, uh, I'm just saying it's like so profound because you're kind of going through your life as a guy, like going along, you know, not knowing what your things are. We all have them. And then yeah. that that's big. Yeah. And, and yeah. to have that, I mean, an actual memory, right? I guess. Yeah. Well, and that's, you know, and much later when I got <sighs> in touch with Nancy's book, uh, after I started to do more inner exploration, um, I thought, well, great. The people thought that you don't have a memory of that. You can't. I said, bullshit. You know, um, were you able at that moment? Did you realize that that's what had happened? Oh, yeah. That that, I, that was that was a definite memory of that fourth day in my life. Probably that's what the record said, where um, because, you know, it said, Oh, your mom took care of you after you were born. She very much loved to be with you. She was very sad when you parted, blah, 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 after four days. Um, I didn't read that before I had this experience, right? That's much after once I went searching, once I went through all the crap of trying to get my records, which I did two times before, but never got them. Um, you know, the, that, that was my experience then. Um, this so is a uh, repressed memory. Yeah, yeah. And you know, the as we all kind of know, the 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 trauma is pre-verbal, right? So there's no mm -hmm. words for it. Um, and there's also, you know, it's hard to differentiate feelings. Um, in this, it was just the raw experience of that happening. Um you, you said so, that this was your relationship with girls always after that. <laughs> Expand yeah, a little well, on that. Well, before and after, I mean, it's still operative in, in a lot of ways. Um, you know, uh, and, and the, the message then was, well, you know, you can get them to kind of like you, but they'll say that they love you and they'll stay with you, but then they won't. So I would do a lot of push away behaviors to make that true sometimes. Uh, not really with this particular relationship. She, she needed to move on. Um, but, you know, that's, yeah. that's what was happening. Um, yes, we can I'm the queen of push away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe Sarah's actually, the, we're both the queens, duchess and queen. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, then I, I, I just, I started working, I moved up north, uh, was a psych tech at a psych hospital. Uh, I, you know, fell in with a lot of spiritual communities because um, when I was a youngster, before I had this experience, I had a, a what I didn't call a spiritual experience then, but uh, I was thinking about Einstein and trying to do a thought experiment going past the edge of the universe because he said it would curve, right? And I said, okay, well, let's find out. Let's do a thought experiment. He does a lot of thought experiments. And my dad was a college professor, so there's shit around the have to read. And, you know, <laughs> um, and so I started thinking, well, what's going to make me curve if I don't want to curve? And I said, oh, shit, there's a barrier there. Oh, here's a brick wall. Let me make that. And I said, well, nothing's keeping me from just jamming through that thing. Uh, I did. And then at some point, 
I realized, oh, the bricks are infinite and boom. I had this experience of being, um, I guess you would call it transcendentally aware, being uh, identical to uh, a space and a consciousness that is the source of all things and is the actuality of all things, right? Mm -hmm. And then I come back into my body uh, through some funnels of light. And I, I don't want to try to do this. Um, it's like a I've, doctor, like a Joe Dispenza meditation. I was going to say that reminds me of Wayne Dyer. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and when I got back into my body, and this is maybe I was 12 or 13, um, you know, I said, oh my gosh, that presence is, is here and it is me and it is everyone else. And the only thing I could really call it was love um, because that's that fully connected feeling. Now, I didn't have that with my adoptive mother, right? Um, I lost it with my biological mother, which is that kind of union love where you're, everything is part of you, you're part of everything. Um, so that I think you know, happened before my uh, experiencing my separation from mom. But I think that gave me kind of a lifelong interest in the deeper parts of being a person. And later, of course, I found out these experiences are described in various kind of religious and spiritual Lit. Mm -hmm. It wasn't an unknown thing. Um, but so, so you're feeling like when you were young, you were feeling this love, like real, the envelopment, I guess, yeah. of love around you yeah. that you don't really have in your home life, even though they love you. Yeah. But you yeah. knew it existed. It's almost like a quest then. Yeah. And I could feel it and see it and be in it with my friends and with my family for a couple of weeks. Right. Mm -hmm. Um and, you know, you, when you're really connected, you feel everything around you and you can feel people's pain. You can, you know, empathize with people. You can connect. You can, you know, do what the right thing is to do then, which is, you know, you're connecting and everybody's healing, right? Um, but, you, you know, so that's kind of why I got interested in psychology, studied that, ended up being a nurse that did, uh, you know, acute psych and, and subacute psych uh, for a living. Um, and then I was up north, just living my life and uh, doing spiritual groups. And I really liked that community aspect of it. Um, but then when there came a conflict and I felt rejected, I just split. I felt so devastated, right? So did that a couple of times, had a short-term marriage, didn't work out. Um, later, you'll find out that it fit the pattern of, uh, well, I'll just say it now. Um, it fit the pattern in all my relationships and it fit the pattern I had with my adopted mother, which was um, a very deep unconscious pattern. I, I discover this later as I do my deep work with my inner little self, uh, is that in order to feel secure and safe, I always unconsciously found uh, a woman that had an unhealable wound mm. and I had an unhealable wound right? One I didn't even know about. And if we could get together, you know, we could stay together. That would work, right? Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's like my adoptive mom. She, uh, much later in life, I found out she had three late-term miscarriages. Uh -huh. And what a wound. I, you know, I have three kids, three, sorry, three kids. And, um, you know, uh, I'm one step away. I'm not a mom, but I've been with her the whole time. And I'm with my kids and I love my kids. What a devastating wound, right? Well, me as a little adopted, you know, four by three month old, I guess, when they got me. Um, no way I can heal that, but I am the solution to that. Were uh, you the first? Yeah, that was the okay. first. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so, you know, that then is, has been a sort of pattern that. So I got married, you know, a, a more stable situation. We've had kids, started work, get my career together. And then um, after our second kid, uh, who's 25 now, uh, I started to, you know, I would always do inner work, but I started to do more meditation. And I realized that the old meditation practices and stuff just were stupid for me. Um, and I decided to just trust myself and just meditate. And so my meditation is to trust myself. And I started to get this feeling and it was just a little shape. And but it, definitely a feeling. It was something that I'd always felt and always pushed away and always intensely before my birthday. 
right? And every many adoptees talk about the pre-birthday thing. Uh, I didn't know that at the time, but you know, I thought, well, it's like three weeks before, three months before my birthday. I'll listen to this thing this time. And so I started meditating and listening to it, and it was a feeling shape. And I started to ask it questions, and it couldn't say anything. Uh, then it started to say a word or two, and then I started to do a Jungian technique called active imagination, uh, which is basically you just imagine it, right? You set some boundaries and you imagine it. So I started writing down a dialogue with this inner voice. And this was the little inner part of me that wanted his mom. And he was really sad, really hurt, really not knowing where she was or how to find her. And then he was really angry at me for like he said, being incompetent mm. in caring for him. He says, you're totally incompetent. You didn't do anything about this. You didn't find my mom. Nobody else would find my mom, you know? And so this inner part of me, this forbidden part, right? Because it's just forbidden. You, it, there's no survival advantage in your adoptive family of, you know, letting this guy out of the cage, right? You, know, you, you got to keep him in the cage, Uh kind of a crude metaphor, but, you know, you, you shove them into the unconscious. Uh, it's just kids are so adaptable, right? We have it makes to me, It makes me sad to think about all the children, just sadness we have that we carry. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, my thing was to fully allow him into my life. And um, he had such intense feelings. Um, just... He was sad, he was angry, he was confused. And then eventually, uh, maybe shortly before my birthday, so maybe three or four months, uh, in these written dialogues, I would just talk back and forth and say, Bobby, blah, blah, blah. He would say something, I'd write it down, I'd say something. And that whole process really developed all sorts of emotion and all sorts of movement and direction. And... Uh, then we finally got to this place, uh, happened over two or three days, where this super intense feeling that turned into, that could only be expressed in a poem, uh, was I Will Wait No More, was the name of the poem. And these poems are just all spontaneous. This isn't, you know, this is just me working through the process. And it was just about waiting for him, waiting for his mommy all that time, and she was never going to come. And then um, the thing that was really remarkable, and to this day, I felt totally new, a totally different person, um, is when I wrote this, my right to be poem. And uh, it was basically, uh, you know, you rejected me, uh, but I'm not rejecting you. I am. So I have the right to be. I have the right to be everything that I am. I have the right to be my pain. I have the right to be in my wisdom. I have the right to be my my happiness. I have the right to be, right to be alive, right? And, and for me, ever since then, a tremendous anxiety uh, that I didn't really know I had was just gone. And it's still gone. And I didn't know that all my life I'd been afraid that if I'd been found out, right, that yeah. I'd be abandoned, right? That that but they uh, see your true colors. Mm -hmm. there you go. Right. Dude, there's something wrong with you. I mean, yep. you're all fucked up. Well, you know, that's the reason that they got rid of you. I mean, yeah, your mom didn't even love you. You know, you hear a lot of these tropes, right? Yes. Um, but they're real feelings, right? Uh, and you know, the advantage for me of doing this meditatively and in writing was that as I brought this part of my life out, it carried all its emotions and tremendous healing for me. And I think a lot of people don't do this kind of thing, but I think most people don't do this. No. Yeah. It, but the, you know, I think the real advantage for me is that it could be completely true and I didn't have to tell it to another person. I didn't have to hear their pushback on me um right mm -hmm. and you know that process just went on for like you know maybe 10 or 12 years after that and boy even in, in the middle years of that you know 
be the dialogues I would have with my biological mom, my adoptive mom, my adoptive dad, uh, you know, um, we said some shit. Oh, sorry. Don't mean to swear. We said it's okay. You can, you, you can, can say, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we said things. We're and not went, trying time. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we said things and went through things that you, you just wouldn't do when you, if you had a real person yeah. in front of you and you wouldn't get those same responses. And for me, um, what that has been is a deep emotional working through for me. Um, and it's affected my outside life in a good way. Um, right. But I, I, how, how old were you when you had the poem that made you say, I'm oh, healed? Oh, that was my right to be moment. And that was about, about 18 years ago. Yeah. Okay. Oh, wow. I'm 69 now. Um, that's a while it back. It seems like fifties is very common for adoptees to yeah. go through some stuff. Well, and when 30s you think about and 50s, it, maybe, I don't know. Yeah. Well, when you think about it, you're coming into your own, right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and you have issues, you have feelings, you have all sorts of stuff going on that, you know, nobody around you and you don't even really know, you know, it, I didn't feel different, different. I saw other people having all sorts of trouble too, right? I have trouble, you know, and I partially succeeded. Yeah, you know, I mean, kind of, I wasn't that different than my peer group. Yeah. You know, I, you yeah. Know, I had some other troubles. Uh, <laughs> um, but I, I, I understand because I still have a hard time like saying that with friends or they're like, but you're this, but you feel inside, like if you only mm -hmm. knew how I don't feel that way, like yes. I don't want someone to really know me. Yeah. And when they do, it's terrifying. I, I'm scared my husband is going to leave me every day because he really knows me now. I'm like, don't leave. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and, and for me, that's the, that's the big anxiety drop that I had then. Yeah. Um, and since then, so after that, then I uh, started reading and I found Nancy Verrier's book. I found out that she lived near me and I just sent her a poem. No, well, it wasn't, wasn't that poem. Um, but <laughs> but I said, hey, you know, uh, what's up, man? You want to do some therapy? Um, and it was neat reading her book because I'd already discovered the wound, right? And, you know, so I don't like to be talked into things. I like to know that it's my real experience. So mm -hmm. this is my real experience. So I brought that to her and we did some work. And then she helped me. She found a searcher for me. And this was quite a while ago, um, back before all the DNA stuff, a lot of people find in DNA relatives. Yeah, now. ancestry but, and all that. Yeah, but back then it wasn't really a thing. Yeah. Um, or if it was, I didn't know about it. And uh, found me a searcher. She found my mom, which was a wonderfully long and agonizing experience. And um, I had two unusual experiences. One, as I kept feeling so good, you know, better than I'd ever felt. And then one day I felt just awful. And I wrote it down in my, in my, diary you know, you know it's all dated and, um, and then you know maybe three or four weeks later we found my mom and we found out that she had passed and it was that exact day oh mm. she had passed so soon into you finding her yeah yeah and i i think too that was one of the reasons that this inner feeling and voice was so intense that i just gave up and said okay dude you know i felt you before and i just because, you know, before my birthday, I'd feel shitty and I just push it aside, you know, just do the adult thing, you know, just we're we'll go have some fun. Now. Um, and uh, so I think that was one of the reasons she died of Alzheimer's. And um, I think that was one of the reasons the feeling was so intense is that we're deeply connected. And on some level, you know, and cognitively also, I knew, I mean, and I would, I would, we would talk in our little dialogues and say, well, Bobby, you know, I'd like to find her too, but, you know, she might be dead. You know, how do you feel about that? And we so we worked on a lot of our feelings before that event. And if she, had, very, if she had had Alzheimer's too, she may not have even been able to know you. Yeah. Well, and that's what my sister Diana said when I, my half sister on my uh, mom's side, is, uh, you know, the searcher was able to identify them. And I wrote them best letter I could. Um, Hey, you know, and this is a crew. I, I was wonderful and lovely and eloquent, and Nancy helped me. And you know, <laughs> but, um, you know, 
hey dude sorry your sorry your mom died you know but uh, you know, i think i'm a kid i know this might piss you off uh <laughs> you might think i'm you know some kind of hack or something but you know dude i'd kind of like to know so could we you know here's the information because it was all information so it's you know born here did the uh you know it's detective work and so i i sent that to him with the description about myself that nancy really helped me with that helping me really trust to be as authentic as i could about me because um if it really was my mom my siblings might notice some similarities if i really put myself out there um and she also cautioned me she said these things can be good they can be bad they can drag on forever they if they're shitty at the first they can change if they're really good at the first they can change <laughs> yeah uh, so i was ready and uh I got responses back from my half brother and sister, and uh, my half brother was like, "Dude, no, this is a scam. There's too many things that you could have looked up on the internet about me. Like he was an endurance athlete, he's a cyclist, and uh, I was training for a marathon, so I put that in there. And uh, so they were suspicious. And my sister was more emotionally attuned, and she said, "Well, you know." I don't want this to break your heart, but I'll explore it because it could, maybe it isn't, but it would explain some things about mom. Um, and um, She had deeper feelings about loss that she probably watched with her mother. Yeah. And, and she also later told what me, was, she said, go ahead. What was uh, the age difference? Oh, um, my older brother is like nine years younger than me. Uh, and my, my sister is, I think, 11 years younger than okay me. um and so uh you know so diana was was just very sweet in the beginning and um you know sensitive and open russ was kind of just hardcore um <laughs> but then russ sent sent uh, he said okay well shit, it couldn't couldn't hurt to send you a picture um send me a picture of mom and i took it i printed it out I didn't want to look at it much. And I drove to a quiet place where I could just look at it. And I looked at it and I saw her arm and I said, Oh my God. My arm. That's my mom. And then every other feature and my smile and her arms and all of that. I cried. I cried. But you cried saw her arm. Well, wow. first, that was the first thing because she was holding it, holding it in a way that I hold my arm. Arm, right and it looked exactly like well that's just i recognize it that's, that's me standing there right yeah oh um, i thought you meant the arm from your memory oh no 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 oh. just her she was probably oh gosh she's a lovely woman probably in her early 50s maybe something like that in the but picture just, yeah just a, a wonderful looking lady yeah you know my mom yeah <laughs> so yeah. I sent Russ back a picture of me and he said, oh, crap, you're my brother. I give up. It's true. Right. <laughs> he did. He kind of came around that fast. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, you know, and I think, you know, I hear a lot of adoptee stories about parents and siblings and getting together. And um, I lucked out, I think, in that I'd done a lot of emotional preparation. I wasn't expecting anything of them. I knew that they're independent folks and that this is shocking news to them and they may have lots of feelings and motives that don't include wanting to have me in their life or wanting to acknowledge me at all. And that it was my, it was my commitment to my own inner little boy that I would just go do that. You know, I wouldn't be incompetent again because he kept calling me incompetent little fucker. And, um, you know, I, he, he knew what to, he knew what words to use when I gave him words to get my attention. So do it. I'm not well. incompetent. And we have so many people that, uh, well, Sarah and I are always talking to people, but we just feel like if you're going into reunion to do this pre-work, mm -hmm. which most people don't get that chance or opportunity or know to do that. Sarah and I didn't know any of this. Yeah. You know? And so you're kind of going in blinded, you don't, and then you're so vulnerable. Yeah. You know? And you had yeah. a little bit of like, okay, I'm okay. They may not, you know, that's a huge thing to have. Yeah. Yeah. And I found out that dispositionally, they were a lot like me. You know, my brother and my sister were smart. My biological dad and mother, I find out, were pretty smart. Um, like my adoptive parents, you'd say, well, they're well-educated. 
Um, so wait, wait. Uh, so your biological father. So you did find out about him a couple of years later. Yeah. Okay. But he was he's a complete unknown uh, to my mom's family, and that's wow. where my sister said, you know, she would never talk about before dad. Right, her dad. Uh, never. I tried. I tried. She would never. There was just no. No. It was like she no. had a, a youth and then a block of life that she didn't talk about, and then their dad. Yeah, yeah. And she was an unusual woman. She she had a bachelor's degree from Oregon State in uh, business, uh, and that's back in the forties. I was oh. born in fifty three, so she had had to earn that in the late forties. Um, you know, came from working class people. Was uh, I think the dad had left, so she had her mom. Uh, but, you know, uh, remarkably strong chick, never knew her. Um, but I think I've inherited some of her stuff, right? And I, I'm, yeah. I'm pretty so strong. So how, how, yeah. Did you, how did you know who your father was? Aha. Uh, well, <laughs> it took me a few years. And I think this is sort of common to start wanting to look for the dad. Um, but in this first year so i found my brother found my half sister we got together um i really vibed good with my brother um we're still very, we're really good friends now um live close to each other do things with each other um and so that first year though i i started then working through the other parts of it so after finding right and finishing that thing then i went through grief and anger and you know work these out in dialogue you know internally um and uh you know why you know i'm mad why did you give me up you, you why i would swear I, you know um i'd get responses back there'd be some reconciliation um you know and i worked through a lot of that with my mom and my adoptive mom in dialogue and then um we got pregnant with our third child um, probably four months or three months after finding my mom. Um, yeah, it wasn't, we weren't really intending to do that, but you know, um, that's, that's our third, our third little girl. She's wonderful. Um, well, we have a boy too, uh, two, two girls on boy. But, um, so that was cool. But then what it started to kick off was, you know, my new self didn't match many of the circumstances and choices that I've made, right? Um, more conflict in my marriage because of this. Uh, I used to think that it was my fault that my wife's wound wouldn't be healed. <laughs> and she would regularly blame me for it because that's the kind of relationship that felt right, right? Based on my adoptive relationship with my adoptive mom. So as my inner sense of me was changing, um, I became much more aware of, uh, the discomfort of those conflicts and kept working on it internally would do some external work on it um and that was really a lot of the next oh gosh hold on i got my little cheat sheet here um that was really most of year two um right so tons of dialogues with both moms in the dialogue uh my adoptive dad in the dialogue uh, are they now, are they still alive at this point? Are you? Oh no, my adoptive parents have died. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and and I think that might be typical too. Your adoptive parents die, and then you're a little more free to go look. Mm -hmm. um, I told my adoptive mom before that I, I started to look. It was one of the unsuccessful ones, you know, several years before all this started. Um, so, you know that that was a lot of it, um, and then. Uh, Third year is where I started to focus more on my dad. And, and Sarah, this gets back more to your question about, you know, what the heck's up with dad? Um, and it started with working through my adoptive father's expectations of me. He was really smart. Um, the mind and all that was uh, a cool thing for him. And I'd gotten in trouble in elementary school and teachers said I was retarded. And so dad had me tested and the testing came back. Well, he's gifted. Um, so then. Retarded to gifted. All in one day. Well, it is, and 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 when your dad, when your adoptive dad values that so much, I had to work through in dialogue with him a lot of the expectations that scare me, 
and that I can't live up to or expectations that I don't want to live up to or uh, expectations. Uh, anyway, you, you know, just to please my dad. Um, and everybody goes through this. You, to please your parents, you, you try to be what they need, right? And I did, and I had some capability for it, but I never embraced it, right? Um, and I think that's still, you know, I'm always an outsider. I was an outsider in my family, right? In my in my adoptive family. Um, so I could never fully embrace a lot of things and become fully legit, right? That's that's the word that used to come up, you know, well, you know you're illegitimate, and, right? You know, so I could get into a lot of things where I was capable and could sort of perform, but I always had to have this air of not quite being qualified, right? But mm -hmm. People would want me because I was fun and I was smart and I was kind and, you know, um, so, you know, I uh, played that most of my life. But, um, you know, as I started to work through these expectations, then I said, well, what about finding my, my biological dad? So I reached out, found the searcher, uh, a different one, because uh, the one I had used first was the uh, ill. And um, she found, uh, the, you know, the, the possibility of my dad. So sent letters. Uh, and got in touch and then oh go ahead. What, what yeah what information did she have to go on was his name on the on your original birth certificate or because yeah, your mother she, like right so your your mom your mother didn't tell anybody didn't tell anybody so yeah, what? She, she did an amazing job of working the uh document the public documents that are out there wow the birth certificates the marriage certificates the timing Mm -hmm. and all of that and the location and area and also i think she may have had oh i think she did have um, a potential last name um on my birth certificate they could find uh apparently it was baby boy ogden mm -hmm. and um one of the traditions back in the 50s you got an orphan kid you get her uh, you know adopt a kid gonna in the hospital name give him the last name of his dad um and uh you know, in her story, oh, sorry. Hannah, I'm, I'm, Hannah, I'm in, I'm talking to people online and I, I'll talk to you later. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Um, we'll cut that. Yeah. So, uh, he's not having a good day. Um, so, uh, so then they found people for me to contact. I contacted them and they are once again pretty open. Um, I'm pretty open. They were pretty open. So I think I'm finding disposition similarities. But I go up uh, to my brother, potential brother, Larry's place, and uh, there's DNA work that you can do. And this is from the paternity soup stuff, right? Where oh. you know, if you if you match, you know, you can match the father's DNA through a son to a son. And then you have to have custody you know, accurate custody of all this stuff with these companies, right? So that nobody's faking anything. So I went up and, you know, hung out with Larry on his porch there. We concocted this story because his mom was still alive, but his dad had died and concocted the story. Oh, it's an old friend. He, he was just coming to hang out a little bit. And so surreptitiously we go, Larry, okay, here's the thing. Now just, you know, you spit in it and just read the instructions and then you're, you know. <laughs> so oh, it, Larry's dad had died. That's your dad. Yeah, yeah. Okay, go on. You betcha. Sure I got the story. Yeah, and my adopter dad had been dead for a long time. Um, but, you know, so when I came away from that, Larry um, Larry w was pretty quiet, um, pretty introspective, kind of spiritual in a way. Um, and I just thought, well, this is my brother. This is the other side of me. You know, my brother Russ is more pragmatic and business-like, uh, still a very kind guy. Um, but Larry was more the artist, right? I used to be a singer. Um, I love music. Uh, you know, I, I chose to be pr pragmatic. You know, didn't pursue any of that stuff in college. Did as a kid, sang in a band, you know, uh, was rivals with the Van Halen band in Pasadena, in my, the band I was in. So, you know, yeah. uh, I liked music. But anyway, so he was much more... Um, much more counterculture, much more uh, artistic. And I, I have a big side of that in me. Um, and how much younger was he than you? 
almost the same amount, probably nine years, eight years. Yeah. And uh, when I when I uh, left there, I knew he was my brother, and I I I thought, I'm not. I'm unique. This is who I am. And a poem wrote itself in my head all the way home. Uh, and it was a long drive. And uh, I wrote it down when I got home. And it's one of the ones I like best. It's called Life. And it's just about, you know, uh, DNA flowing through the river of time and uh, meeting and intertwining and passing on parts. And, uh, you know, uh, I felt at that point, I mean, the story was complete for me. Um, and wow. that felt really good. Uh, and then they, it, their mom was alive and they didn't want to tell the mom. Um, and so I kind of struck up a relationship with my, my sister, Sue, and, uh, she told Is me Sue, something about who, who's Sue? She's the sister of Larry. She, uh, there's in that side of the family, there's two brothers and one sister. Mm -hmm. Sister yeah. Sue is, is the sister. And um, she was very generous, and um, I learned a lot of things about him. Uh, that he was a, a NASA rocket scientist, worked wow. in the central, uh, yeah, in what's that, Vandenberg maybe, um, and uh, then kind of shifted and went into environmental science and loved nature. And I just gotten out of trying to once again illegitimately getting into a PhD program at Oregon. It was about, about um, environmental studies and a second option. I chose philosophy and I didn't get in. I hadn't done any preparation. It was competitive. What the hell was I thinking? Um, I like but, that, that you have the side that falls not far from the tree with him, though. Yeah. I mean, well, and that's and, really what. And you have the artsy like. side, the spiritual side. You're kind of an interesting mix of science and spiritual. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and it, was, it was neat to see where that comes from. Mm -hmm. You know, um, that, that, that there's a dispositional roots out there and talent roots out there that, you know, you resonate with. And kind of long story short, um, several years later, once their mom had died, they, they invited our family up to their big Thanksgiving party. Oh, and it was just wonderful. Um, people were just shocked. You know, you can look at my hair and, and, and stuff. And, you know, I was balding and I was older and, you know, Everybody was just, and especially the the younger, the children of my my half brothers and sisters, were all like, "That's Grandpa!" <laughs> wow. Yeah. What? And That's I see cool. pictures, and yeah, you know, he looks a lot like me, right? Um, <laughs> and uh, so that was really affirming and nice. And so I've had on the reunion side of the world, um, very accepting people. Um, I think part of it is disposition. They're a lot like me. Um, I'm pretty open and accepting. I think dispositionally I am, um, not just as an adoptee having to accommodate, which is another whole story that's painful. Um, but um, yeah, they're, they're a lot like me. And um, also, you know, my expectations, I, I wanted to meet them and be with them, but I wasn't expecting them to fix anything in me. Um, I or think that's big. They probably sense yeah. that. I think people sense yeah. that. Yeah, or get anything from them, or even demand tons of information about my dad. Even with my, you know, my longest uh, sibs on my mom's side, you know, I, I don't probe them all the time about mom. Well, yeah. Tell me more about mom. What about mom? I want to know about them, right? Um, I think you learn things as you get to have relationships. That's when you learn them. You yeah. Know? You don't get oh, to yeah. just demand it. Tell mm -hmm. uh, really quick, how did they? Um, does anybody know how were they together? I feel like we don't know their. Yeah, not to know the story. You don't. That's the big mystery, and everybody is so curious about that, and nobody knows. So, my theory is based on where people were when, yeah. is that my dad was in Korea, and he was. Um, we, 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 because he's a math guy, I guess, or had that aptitude. He was uh, you know, doing the artillery targeting, you know, mm -hmm. in this wind with this charge, you know, or what target are you going to hit over there? Um, and then he got out of the service. Um, I think that he came back to San Francisco. And my mom was working for Standard Oil um, in San Francisco after getting her business degree, right? And uh, That's pretty so progressive. She, She's pretty progressive. Oh, yeah. That girl. Ooh, that's yeah. cool. 
Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, so she then, um, according to the adoption lip that we got, which is kind of partial, but it's there, um, you know, decided to not tell the father and because she thought he was pleasant looking, but she didn't want to, you know, marry him. Um, that's what it said on the <laughs> that's what it said in the uh, report and oh, so she would have been sarah i find you pleasant, <laughs> pleasant. <laughs> it's, like one of the, it's a terrible <laughs> insult <laughs> i'd rather be like horrible than pleasant so they were they weren't super young she was right. in her 20s yeah oh yeah yeah this wasn't the teen thing this you know she was out doing a job he was Here's a dude coming back from the army, right? I mean, you know, she, did, Korean she War. didn't want to have a, a baby, and back then that ended all she yeah. was doing. Yeah. Well, and my hunch is she saw advancement for herself as a as a as a possibility, and came from a, a kind of a poor working class background. She got a bachelor. She was working at Standard Oil. You know, I think that, and back in the day, there weren't that many opportunities for women. You guys know. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and so I think that she wanted to marry right. Oh, and oh gosh, that was the last name of the guy who's been married. Okay, but um, W R I D. Um, but at any rate, so I, I think that she just made that decision and said, no, 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 this isn't going to work for me. This isn't the plan that I made. And in researching it further, I think she went over to Booth Memorial uh, Unwed Mothers Home in Oakland, I, and I've been reading about that, um, and. The unwed mothers' homes. This one was, I think, by Goodwill or Salvation Army. Maybe it had a hospital upstairs, and the girls would stay there, do crafts, occupy themselves, uh, and then they'd go upstairs to have their babies. Um, so I think I was had upstairs there, and then taken away after four days. Gosh! Wow! Yeah, and so you know, when we tell the story, it's just the story, right? But then when you think about what goes on. Now that we've all yeah. had children, you ha- you're a father, we're mothers. It's, oh. it's a uh, it's a yeah. thing. Wow, well, yeah. what a <laughs> crazy, crazy, what a story, Bob. That's really yeah, yeah. So I think that that's there. I, I, I think that that's the origins there, and that's why you know when I wrote that you know uh, DNA flows in the river of time thing, it was just uh, it's a great poem. It's super long. I read it to you, but it take forever. Um, you know. Uh, that's what happens. I would right? like if you would share your poem for us. Yeah, you now, can, but to put on our um, site. Yeah, you can put it okay. on. Yeah, that'd be yeah. great. Yeah. So yeah. where? So now, you feel we were just discussing. Does do, can adoptees ever truly heal? But but you yeah. feel. Uh, I don't know what's the word I'm oh. looking for. Maybe oh. whole. You feel well, whole. Feel, Maybe I not feel, healed. I, but whole. I feel whole, but I think that the big complication for me once I felt whole was becoming aware of how my life was constructed, all my choices, all the jobs that I did, mm-hmm. all the family that I created uh, was created by a partial self mm-hmm. who didn't feel real. Well, he felt real, but he didn't feel real and secure the way I feel now. And so the next 10 years is trying to work all that through right um and it's hard because there's stuff you can't change right i mean it's super deep actually oh, i mean we we know it, but just how you said it again the partial self you know constructing yeah. your life mm-hmm. on a partial self yeah and and we all do it and we have to right we have no have a tools or we didn't yeah, have the tools yeah. to or the knowledge you know as we said pre-verbal trauma and and you're going to do the best you can, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, and and sometimes that looks really super messy. Sometimes it looks overachieving. Sometimes, it, you know, depends on your, I, I suppose, the strategies you pick somehow, not real consciously. But, you know, I, I for me, I think I just navigated along my existing abilities, right? And used them to form a self that could, make it in that family and make it with my friends um hope to never get exposed unconsciously i wasn't you know, uh, and then you know in my youth you know use a lot of drugs and alcohol to cover that uh yeah mm-hmm. cover that fear i did i did when i was younger i really did like to get to a, 
a less fearful place through drinking in particular, um, which kind of helped temporarily ease that. Uh, uh, then it just it. adds a whole other host of other problems. <laughs> yeah. <you know? laughs> it sure does. Yeah. So, uh, worse. Like the problems yeah. become worse. But yes. oh, yeah. If you put and all that, us that's... adoptees together, we would have definitely partied together. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Form. And, and then, I think you're, yeah. you're, you're very, you know, healing for others to hear this. Actually. Yeah. This has been really great and enlightening. I feel like we need a part two with you. <laughs> um, That'd be great. And then, you know, and then this is just kept on, right? And, you know, I'm not going to go into all the details of all the inner work on uh, basically trying to help my outer life match my inner life better. And, you know, what could I do? What could I not do? Um, But then COVID threw me for a loop and I really got sort of bummed out and uh, what do I call it? kind of, I, I used to do a lot more taking care of my physical self, you know, um, kind of more regular exercise, more trying to keep my weight normal and uh, not normal, but like at least reasonable for me. Um, and COVID threw me for a loop and my daughter for a loop. My daughter got, uh, uh, had a, has a bad case of OCD, uh, it was health fears. And so the COVID fears kicked that off. But I just got sort of apathetic about my own physical well-being. Um, and, you know, this, this, oh, what the heck? What the hell? I, you know, come on. You know, what are you going to do? You're going to die. And, and I resumed my dialogues with little Bobby about two months ago or three months ago around that issue. And I said, well, what do you have to say about this? You know? And he said, I lost my body. So said, what, what, what do you mean? I lost my body. I go, oh, right. When we were separated from mom, for you, that was your body. Part of your body got taken away. And so, you know, instead of now looking for the relationship, you know, uh, to the mom, uh, we started talking about, and I started then working on trying to be more responsible about my relationship to my physical self. And to your own self, it's really to you. I mean, like, you have to be kind to yourself now. Yeah, yeah. And so I've been mostly, you know, really emotionally centered and you know, mentally centered, working all this through and a relationship centered. Um, but, you know, now I'm kind of getting to that level of, well, dude, it also comes down to just you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, it's always, uh, you know, there's always more to, to find out and to <laughs> dig into and it just, it just keeps going and you're 69 and you're still digging I yeah which is oh, great yeah, you know that's yeah. a, a small percentage of people i think on the planet that do that bob yeah. thank you so much for your generosity and sharing your story and for sure and for coming on and being patient with us with scheduling <laughs> interviews and <laughs> oh, this is just wonderful this has been my my best part of the day so far good oh, i'm glad Ours too. I love, I love this actually. It's yeah. Really interesting. We could just keep talking all night, but. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah. Well, thanks. Well, thanks, Bob. Thank you so much, Bob. Okay. And I'll send you that. Uh, yes, that do. Yeah. yeah. We'd love yeah. that. We'd love to put that somewhere for sure. <laughs> Thank all you. right. Okay. Thanks, bye. Bob. Okay. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. I'm so glad we finally got to talk to Bob because he's been kind of a cool friend of ours throughout the summer, you know, yes, back and, and forth. lots of patience. Um, and I love that his, you know, he seemed he's on the other side of this journey in a way. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of timely with the ending of our season yeah. and our book, uh, yeah. you know, the, the, the full circle of the journey and yeah, the quest for wholeness, healing and yes, right? the quest for wholeness. Yeah. And I, I, I love all the work he's done, like really unabashedly, I guess that's the word digs deep about mm-hmm. talking to his inner self and, and, and a lot of men, I'm not saying men, but they don't do that work. It's embar- or they do, but they don't talk so openly about mm-hmm. it. And he's, and he's so open about letting that in there. It makes me very, it just makes me happy. It's like emotional and Beautiful, it was, I know it really, it really is. And brave, 
Right. Vulnerability is brave. It is brave. I was really admiring of him as he was talking because I just thought, gosh, I haven't haven't really gotten there yet. Yeah, you know, I and I really related to his <laughs> his um relationship patterns. You know, I related a lot to yeah. that to those relationship patterns and like, gosh, it's you know, setting up a dynamic that you continue to Always. repeat until you can get it right, you know, and that you're never going to get it right. Um, no, he, I was thinking that too, like, am I less than, I don't know. I've done all this work, like Bob's <laughs> ahead of the game. <laughs> well, he's older than us. Yes. There you go. Very older and, and very young spiritually. Just cool. Yeah. Really cool. It was great. And this has been a great season. Wow. That's an amazing season. I can't wait for the next one and being with you and doing all this. Thing Me too. You know. it's, I look forward to it. <laughs> Me too. Okay. We'll see I you love next you. season. I love you. Bye. Bye. Bye.